Will Lawrenson, the founder of Customer Who Click, discusses the importance of conversion rate optimization in e-commerce. He explains that CRO involves customer research, problem solving, and optimizing the website to improve advertising efficiency, conversion rates, and customer satisfaction. Brands typically reach out to CRO agencies either because they have a problem on their website or because they want to scale and improve their performance. Will introduces the UAM method, which is usability, anxiety, and motivation that his agency uses to analyze and suggest areas for improvement. He emphasizes the significance of usability, search functionality, and clear navigation in enhancing the user experience. In our chat, Will discusses the importance of reducing anxiety and building trust in e-commerce customer journey. He emphasizes the need to make search more obvious and to provide reassurance, reputation, and reliability to customers. We've also discussed the importance of highlighting both the benefits and the features of a product, as well as the challenges of abundant carts. Will provides tips for digital commerce leaders, including the importance of speaking to customers and asking for help. Welcome to the Ecom Pulse, your heartbeat to the world of e-commerce. I'm your host, Eitan Kotter. Join us as we meet with industry leaders, marketing experts, and the innovative minds behind the tech that is shaping the e-commerce future. So plug in, gear up, and get ready for a pulse-pounding journey into the heart of e-commerce. Hey, Will, how are you? Hello, I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great. How is London these days? Uh, it's about as London as every, all, all your listeners will, will yes, uh, I'm asking, be, right? be guessing, I think. <laughs> same, same. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, Will, we, hear, uh, we have plenty of things to discuss today. Uh, maybe we'll start with just a quick intro about yourself and about your companies to give some context to the discussion. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I'm Will. I run Customs Who Click. We're a, a CRO agency for e-commerce. Um, been doing this for about four and a half years now as an agency. Um, and before that, my my experience was in-house. So I was head of conversion for uh, a, a big gambling company here in the UK. Mm-hmm. And then before that, it was actually startups, uh, including one of my own. So doing a little bit of everything because that's what you do in startups, right? Um, yeah. So touching on pretty much everything you, you can do in marketing. But everything kind of led me down that route of customer research, like, what are the problems we're trying to solve e- either on the website or in our customers' lives and looking for ways we can, we can optimize for that to, um, uh, to make our advertising more efficient, to, to convert people better and, and make people happier with our products. So yeah, I kind of essentially fell into CRO um, just because I was doing it anyway. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, when I, when I left my last job, you know, this, this is what I wanted to do. Okay, so this, this is very interesting. So why you are so passionate about CRO and what makes it so interesting for you? I think it's, it's the part of the research and the data. So mm-hmm. speaking to customers, you know, running interviews, getting feedback from people, um, and also the problem-solving element of it. You know, looking at a website and thinking, why aren't people viewing products? Or why aren't people adding to cart? Like, what's, what's missing from this experience? Is it something more technical on the page? That is a, a problem and needs fixing, or um, you know, are, are people anxious about the purchase and they haven't, you know, they're not convinced that the the product is right for them, um, or could it be that you know they're getting all the inf- they're finding the products, they're getting all the information, but they're just sat there going, okay, well, what, why, like, why is your product special? You know, why should I buy your product? And so. You know, you might have them fully convinced it's the right product, but you know, if they're going to sit there and go, "Well, you know, I've also got five other tabs open. I can see five other similar products. Mm-hmm. Which one is going to wow them?" Yeah. Now, this uh, the things that you've mentioned right now are, are like generic. It's not like niche specific or anything, right? Related right to how they're differentiating your products, right? How you optimize. Uh, so it's very, very clear these are areas that needs. Uh, Obviously, to be explored and evaluated. When you engage with it with a customer, right? What are the process? How the process works? What what's, what's usually are the you know the triggers that uh, you know, customers are reaching out, and how do you start analyzing what's going on and suggest areas for improvement? 
Yes, I mean, there's two main reasons a brand will reach out to us. One is they think they have a problem on their website, and so they need someone to to come in and fix it and work it out. Or more commonly, actually, um, brands who are happy, like happy with how things are going. You know, they're they're profitable. They you know they're they're selling well. Um, you know, they're running a good company, but they want to do better. Mm-hmm. And they want to scale more, and they want to look for opportunities to, you know, increase their conversion rates, increase AOV, lifetime value, reduce returns rates, reduce the amount of discounts uh, they give out, all, all these different things. So those are, you know, that that's the more common type of brand. You know, one, the the ones who are who are there, you know, they're they're happy with how things are going. They're not in panic mode. They're not worrying about, you know, do they need to switch off ads or cut their budget. They just want to do more and, and better, and so you know when we start working with a brand, we've we've got our unique methodology. It's the UAM method, uh, which I kind of hinted at just just earlier, which is usability. So, can people find the products they want on your website, um, and can they buy them? So, can they select their options properly? Can they make any customizations necessary? Um, do they get to use their preferred payment method? Um, but it also could be things like, you know, if I need to get in touch with someone and ask them a question, have you got live chat, which makes it really easy, or do I have to submit an email and then leave and hope that someone gets back to me soon? Then we have the uh, A, which is anxiety. Um, so these are the questions and concerns someone has about your your products and your business. Right. So the easy example is always food, right? Um, or another one would be would be fashion. But let's go with food. If I'm buying a sort of like ready meal or like a meal kit or something, and I've got a food allergy, I have to know whether that allergen is is present in this product. So if it states the allergens, I can be reasonably confident and say, well, you know, you haven't listed the one I've uh, that I've got, so I'm fine to buy it. Yeah. If you did not list allergens, then I might be able to read through the instruct uh, not instructions the ingredients. And I can see that, you know, there's no nuts in there, for example, or no peanuts. But if you don't state that it's free of that allergen, I can't be 100% sure and therefore I cannot buy it. Yeah. Right. Other products people might be willing to take a risk with, right? I guess the fashion example. You know, we know people, I uh, actually worked with a footwear retailer a few uh, a couple of years ago, um, and they saw a huge number of people were buying two pairs of this same shoe they would buy you know a size eight and a size nine and then they would keep the one that fit them and send the other one back send the other one back yeah right so they don't have a problem making that purchase however you've got to deal with a return which is expensive sure we don't want that but there are going to be other situations where people people don't want to shell out the money in the first place right i buy i buy my t-shirts and things from true classic um who are doing fantastically have got an incredible website it's a reasonably large amount of money to put down in one go right uh, you know to, to get free shipping for example i think it's about might even be a hundred dollars yes. now so i don't want to spend a hundred dollars or a hundred pounds if i'm not sure it's going to be right for me yes i'm thinking right this could take i didn't know this actually when i first bought them but you know i think they took about 10 days to arrive the first time Okay. Um, because I think they ship from the States. So that's 10 days where I've already spent 100 pounds. Then I've got to try them on. If they don't fit, I've got to send them back, wait for them to get back, and then I'm going to get my refund. Yes. Or I could go down to a shop, try them, try some products on, and, uh, and, and purchase yeah. the ones and only spend the money on, on the ones that fit. So it's really important that we yes. and, you know, do everything I- we can to, to explain products and make sure people are. Know, have the information they need to make that decision. Yeah, like we true. I tried that link at least five times to make a purchase and I didn't, right? Because of that same reason. That first purchase is so expensive. I mean, they're doing a phenomenal marketing job. And as you said, their website looks amazing, right? But I, <laughs> I, I probably I will make a purchase one, <laughs> one time along the line, but I didn't for, the, for at least five times that I tried. I mean, I, I, I can say they are fantastic. I've made a second purchase. Um, I can't see myself buying from anywhere else unless wow. true yeah. classic goes you know disappears because also even though it's when this right it's, it's a t-shirt right it's a plain t-shirt and when you put it like that it sounds like nothing special 
But now I know that I've got t-shirts that fit me and I like the fit and I like the feel of them. Why would I go anywhere else? Now my anxiety about purchasing from somewhere else is, I don't know if your products are going to be as good as True Classic. Yes. So instead of taking the risk, again, taking that risk on that purchase, you might as well just buy from True Classic again. Right. Yeah. You know, I know the same thing would happen uh, like skincare um, and things like that. Once people find a product that works for them, it's really, really difficult to get people to move. Yeah. Um, but and I, then like on, the, sorry, I like the anxiety oh. definition, right? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I, mean, I, I did have, I, I did give one talk once, um, quite when, quite early when we'd launched the UAM uh, methodology, and I got asked to change it because they didn't want to use anxiety as a term okay. um, on there, which I, I, I kind of get in a way, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so the other, the other side of anxiety is the, the business as well, right? I've got to, you, you've got to trust the business. You've got to think, okay, they've got, uh, they've got good reviews. I can see live chats. So they're contactable. They've got an address. Um, and there's some on, offsite stuff as well, right? I, I might look at your Instagram account. If I can see there's a story there and you post a lot and you get engagement, these are all good signs. And then we've got motivation, which is kind of that, that final important factor, really. I can, if I can find and buy the product, that's great. If I can find all the information I need about that product, that's great. But if I'm not sat there going, I, I need this now, I want this as soon as possible because I just, I want this product because it's mm -hmm. going to make a difference to my life. If I'm not feeling that, then the chance of me buying just plummets. Yeah. Because I'm probably going to have three or four tabs open. There'll be other websites I'm aware of. I will just go browse. And if it might be possible that none of them wow me, but if I need the product, I need the product, and then I'm probably going to go with price or something like that. So it's the products that wow you. And that's what True Classic did, right? That's why I spent more money than I've ever spent before, I think, on T-shirts. Yeah. Because I was really, really confident that these were going to be different and going to be special. And that's, that's what got me over the line. Yes, yes. So if you try to probably zoom into any of this, uh, the usability part, the anxiety part, and the motivational part. In terms of usability, we know that uh, you know, attention span is very, very low, right? It's even below two seconds. I think the last report I saw, it's like 1.7 seconds, right? Attention span <laughs> for users have on any new website. And, um, and also discoverability is, is a challenge, right? I mean, you need to find what you're looking for. What are the... So I, I'm going to ask you like best practices or tips like in each one of those categories for the listeners to, to have you know, more value from, from this chat. So let's dissect usability. What are the things that you see that yeah. are maybe like common for most websites I, I don't know if this is a, uh, even an option and that that you, you usually pay more more attention to and focus on improvements so just one quick comment on best practices yeah right i i, I believe in best practices in a certain way which is you know best practice in cro is to test to do research to do analysis um best practice in e-commerce is to have a functioning normal e-commerce site, right? And then you start playing with it and adding things. So if you've got navigation, a normal navigation, normal search, uh, the ability to just pick an option, add to cart, go to checkout and buy, that's best practice. Mm -hmm. right? If you start veering away from those bits, those basic fundamentals, that's where we start to see some problems occurring. Yes. But after that, when it comes to sticky add to cart buttons and video content and re even reviews and payment methods, all these different things. Mm -hmm. There's very few best practices that just work across the board. You need to test, you need to understand if it's going to work for your, your audience. Okay. Okay. So, but coming back to usability, um, I, I guess the, the main two would be uh, search depending on what you're selling. Um, obviously some brands, if you've got a limited number of products, you don't really need to search. Um, not, not many people use it. Um, or if you've got products that are a bit uh, well, difficult to search for, because people might not know what to search for, or, um, you know, I, I worked with a custom PC brand, um, before people 
aren't searching for a specific you know pc type because firstly you don't you don't know the name of it because their their names are super long because they go into yes, all the detail um but also the whole point was you're building something custom so you go into you, you follow their flows you answer questions you, yeah. you build your products but search is really really powerful so if you're in like fashion skincare um beauty anything like that jewelry um search works really well um, and the same goes for navigation so navigation just the most important thing is keep it simple and keep it obvious right if i click on your navigation bar so whether it's shop all or if you've got men's women's you know if i hover over it or click it any of those categories that open up should be immediately obvious what i'm going to get if i click on that yeah so we've got clothing for example it should say t-shirts shirts jeans trousers shorts jackets jumpers that sort of thing right as soon as you start putting in your own branded terms no one else has a clue what you're talking about and you're asking people to open every single category just to work out what's behind that page yeah you know it's it's not too bad in your standard d2c e-commerce um, but we do sit a lot in kind of, um, I've seen like motorbikes, custom PCs, um, and some like health, health and beauty stuff where, you know, they, they're trying, they're trying to point you in that they are trying to point you in the right direction with this collection, but they just name it something that doesn't mm-hmm. actually do that. And you would only know if you, you only know if you know, right. So instead of being the. Uh, the nighttime routine, right? Which is really clear and obvious. They'll have some branded term, okay. right? The, you know, I, I don't have anything off the top of my head, but they'll have a branded term and you're just looking at it like, I don't know. I don't know what this is. Yeah. So, so that's just, yeah, uh, that's, I, I'd say probably one of the most important things. Yes. Just make it easy. So, yeah. so what I hear you say is that it's okay to direct users to my collection for example because i have a higher margin there and i want to promote that collection that's fine as long as you're using in this not not branded terms or not specific terms just commonly used terms right so to, to, for users to quickly understand where they're where they are in the navigation right yeah exactly and you know obviously like some fashion brands some jewelry brands have collections because they're collections from a, a designer mm-hmm. for example but that still needs to be clear. Okay. Right. So, and, and I think there's, you know, the same terms get used by different, by different brands in different ways. So some brands will use collections as like categories. Yes. Right. So you'll click on collections and you'll see t-shirts, shirts, Mm -hmm. and all that. Others use collections as the special stuff, right? The, the stuff they've put together specifically (laughs) for that collection. Yes. And, and and so that's where things get a bit confused. And you know, if I go into onto a jewelry brand uh, website, I go into collections and I see all these random names. I just I, it just puts me off because yeah. I don't have a clue. Right? I might not know who these people are mm-hmm. because I'm not in that space. Yes. Um, okay. So yeah, and and the same goes. So I just just yeah. quickly on like the homepage, for example, um, or e- even on collection pages where you're linking across things, just keep things quite high level as much as possible and then let people dig in from there. Mm-hmm. So on the homepage, just get people into the shop and let them start finding their way from there. You know, I had a, the footwear retailer actually um, from a, a while ago, their main call to action on the homepage always led you to their new in um, collections mm-hmm. and never to just all, um, all the products. And they also didn't have like all men's, all women's um, available in, in their navigation. Okay. And I, I kept pushing them on this. They had a specific reason for doing it that I could not shift them away, mm-hmm. but we could see it was a problem because yes. people were, were clicking through and then seeing that they were already on kind of a filtered page and they didn't want that. They wanted just everything so that they could do their filtering. Yes. So this is very true also for the search, right? I mean, people are searching for terms that they are probably... You know, thinking about considering it needs to be aligned 
with the way you describe your products, PDPs, and, and variety of keywords in the website, right? So when people are searching and yeah. typing, right, uh, what is the expected result that you will, you would love to see from, from that search results? Um, well, I guess the, the expected result would be a set of products which either matches that search term or matches the like the requirement. Mm-hmm. Right. So again, like some people might not search for your product exactly. Or or they might not call it the same thing. Mm-hmm. So in, initially, you know, if you haven't got any data, you, there's not a lot you can do apart from say, okay, well, we know a common term for this product is also this. So let's just make sure both of those turn up the same result. But then once you have once you've been live for a little while or once you, you know your search has got data, go into that data, see what people are actually searching for, and then go tailor that search experience to make sure they're getting the right stuff. Yes. So, you know, if if people are searching for comfy sofas, for example, right? Comfy is probably a word that never appears anywhere on your website. Right. Yeah. But if people are searching for it, they've probably got something in mind as to what that means. And, you know, you've, you've, you've got to have a think about that. And at least, I mean, at least just show sofas. Yes. Right. I mean, you, um, you, I mean, you searched in some of the website and there was a big menu just open up, right? With, with a specific product, maybe a collection we spoke about, obviously some special uh, discounts or you know, a loyalty program uh, benefits or like it's an opportunity to over obviously showcase a lot of things right and just redirect users the way you want them also an opportunity to use content recommendation maybe for the most advanced you know searches yep. around out there but again it's all as you said it depends on the amount of data that, that the brand has that been able to make you know such decisions and and yeah and if, I mean, you know the, these people are high intent right yeah. they're searching it's yeah. because they are looking for something I mean, obviously, their search term might be a bit vaguer, but they have something in mind they want, mm-hmm. and they are probably considering buying, or at least doing you know doing that research for a purchase. Yeah. So yeah, take the opportunity, like put put a bunch of options in front of them, allow them to sort and filter. If you have got a large number of products, um, put some key messaging in front of them. Um, I mean, you could even potentially offer a discount there, and say you know exactly uh, these these products because you've searched. All these products are five percent off or something. Yeah. What will be a, a let's say a good or very good conversion rate for those shoppers who actually search? Um, there's no set conversion rate. Yeah, but um, from your experience, also, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we see if if they're using a good search function, mm-hmm. we see you know around four times wow. the, the conversion rate. Four times. Um, sometimes higher. I think yeah. I think the most we've seen. I think it was about eight point four times, eight point four times higher um, for people who searched wow. and, and then purchased. For most brands, it's probably around the four mark. And if you're using quite a basic search, um, that doesn't you know immediately start prompting you with results and things. It could be could be around two. Yeah, but that's still you know that's still two times the conversion rate for people who want to search. So that's a hot topic right i mean website should encourage users to search in various ways right <laughs> just to get them into the well, funnel and then into the into the buying nec- process at least <laughs> it, it's not necessarily encourage them to search because you're, you're gonna have loads of people who don't want to search yes, they're still buyers so they don't want to search but it's make search obvious uh-huh. we all know right as as marketers and, and people in e-commerce we all know the search icon is in the top right corner yes. on almost every website or in the top in the middle. Customers don't think like that, right? Some people, some people will know, some people don't have a clue, right? Or, or they, some people, honestly, some people don't know what that icon is, right? <laughs> um, that's, I know yeah. that, sounds, that probably sounds a bit mental to some people, but some people just don't know these things yeah. because they've never clicked it. Yeah. Or... Um, or they've only seen it as a an open bar which says search. So they don't know what the magnifying glass is. So we, we've run a bunch of tests on this, and it's it's I think it's probably our test with the with the highest success rate across clients, wow. which is just making search more obvious, um, so that we're not putting it in front of people and saying use search. 
we're just making sure that when they're on the screen, they go, oh, there's a search bar there. Like, why don't I use that instead? Yes, yes. I'm happy we've discussed this because it sounds to me like a very, very important topic. So, that, yeah. So in terms of the anxiety part of things, it's obviously the effort there is to reduce maybe objections, be transparent on data and like in product information description, whatever communication is relevant. And, and it's all about building some kind of a trust factor, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Around that. And I know you have the 3R trust method, right? You want to spend more time, probably discuss about that. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a few ways of looking at it from an anxiety point of view and something I was thinking about this recently actually a lot of brands spend way too much time on benefits uh-huh. right in fact for years I think there was the, like the popular phrase was features tell benefits sell mm-hmm. and people took that to mean don't use features yep. only use benefits but if you only use features uh, sorry benefits. if you only use benefits yeah. then people don't know what you're actually selling, right? Yes. Um, I mean, or, oh, sorry, not, not exactly what you're, what you're selling, but like, what's this thing actually yeah. do? I mean, it, it was a hot topic that's been years. I mean, in any sales course, right, you talk about don't sell features, sell benefits, values, yeah. don't do like feature dumping or spray and pray type of, you know, all the yeah. features stuff. But, and there's a huge, and, you still want to know there's stuff. a higher layer than that. Just talk about the emotional connection and the, like the higher layers of beyond benefit, right? And people, right, they're exposed to advertising of, from everywhere about, you know, emo, trying to, brands trying to build some emotional connection with their, with their shoppers through emotions. But at the end of the day, you know, people are buying products and the features are very, very important. You know, you need the size, yeah. the color, right, fits are not fit so yeah i mean so, what are your thoughts on this i mean it's it's like a big spectrum of you know data that or information that can be spread spread across exactly yeah so i, I think benefits benefits fit more into the motivation piece right because okay. that's yeah that's what we're trying to do we're trying to motivate them to buy which is where we use the benefits mm-hmm. but the features side right now if you're if you're buying a bookshelf for example or a desk yes and someone just told you the benefits of it <laughs> you'd be like well but but how big is it? Yeah. How do I set it up? How do I install yeah. it? Like, what's it made of? Right, you, you've got none of these questions. Right? Again, coming back to the food example, yeah. if we took, if all all a page said was this product is great at helping you lose weight, seventy percent of our customers have lost weight, and all these things, but didn't tell you any ingredients mm-hmm. or any nutritional content, mm-hmm. you're not you're not going to buy it, are you? Right, you've got questions to be answered about the product. And that's where that's where the anxiety piece comes in, but yeah, another part of it is trust. Right, so we've got our our, our three R trust method, which is reassurance, reputation, and reliability. So reassurance is like contact information, right? I want to know that I can contact this business. Um, I want to know that it's a real business, mm-hmm. and that uh, you know if. Well, firstly, if I make a purchase, I'm going to get it, and that's all going to be fine. But if I have any problems, there is actually a real business here that that's going to help me with it. Um, obviously, reputation is social proof, um, so that could be things like uh, reviews of the business, reviews of the products, um, but it's also a bit of the the offsite activity as well. So again, I, like I mentioned Instagram earlier, but loads of people will go to an Instagram account just to see. You know, does this look like a, a legit business? Do people leave comments about products? And are those comments good or bad? Yeah. Right. So if if you get if you if you post on Instagram and there's loads of comments on your post, that you know from a from a, a purely metric side point of view, you'd be like, oh great, we're getting loads of engagement. But if loads of people are coming there looking at those comments and everyone is saying, where's my item? Where's my product? Where's my order? Or yeah, it sucks. It doesn't work for me, and and all that stuff. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. Yeah, make one purchase. bad so, review worth maybe a thousand good reviews, right? So it doesn't have to yeah, be a exactly. lot of and bad reviews, even one or two. Another another great example of that is actually uh, Facebook ads, okay? Right, where you see comments. So it's really good to to encourage comments, but also just get people, um, get people commenting, reply to those comments, um, uh, as long as they're happy. Again, this this is probably something where I'm a bit biased because I'm a marketer. But I am really, really, really put off 
if I click on comments on a Facebook ad and I can see that there's however many comments, 17 comments or whatever, I click in there, I click on all comments and there's like one, hmm. maybe more. And I'm thinking you've hidden these comments because they're bad. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know if a lot of people think like that. I probably not. It's probably something that I just, I'm just biased yeah. on because I'm, I'm a marketer, but yeah, so there's, there's onsite and offsite. Um, trust elements there and then the reliability is kind of refunds and returns like if i if something goes wrong um obviously on the the reassurance it's i can contact you and that sort of stuff but the re- reliability is you know is your returns policy actually good um you know and uh am i, am I going to get a refund do you have loads of costs involved um and stuff like that yes. so so you're, like, you're referring about things yeah. like social proof uh, increasing the trust factor Maybe use uh, maybe bringing those reviews ba- back to your to your e-commerce to the to the product page, putting those reviews there as a proof of confidence, right? And maybe use video to showcase things, which is more clearly, yep. and just be more specific on the specification that's all and, of the of the product, right? Yeah, and and again, it all it it all really really depends on what you're selling and who you're selling to, um, which which really determines the the types of reviews that work and work better Mm -hmm. so we're working with a a kind of children's young like very young small children's nutrition brand at the moment and they do really really well with video content and ugc like from from summer influencers um you know but but they're also doing it with their with kids on the video right so you you're like okay this is actually a parent Um, they're saying this product is really good and I think when you're giving something to your child, you want to be really, really confident that this is all ke- all okay. Because yes. I suppose you can't necessarily determine yourself whether that product's good because you're not taking it. Yeah. But if loads of other people are saying it's great, then then you're good. Yes, I guess that's a very good example with the kids. But you know, influencers. I mean, a lot of brands are spending more and more in influencers. But I think the most, yeah. uh, more most of the shoppers knows that. They're getting paid, and you know it's not that authentic, and so it, it's it's there's also challenges around that, right? So obviously, uh, things yeah, are... I think I think even that is a bit. I, I think it's 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 come out. I, I think there are a lot of people pushing that message that people know that UGC with influencers are are actually ads, and they're not effective anymore. <laughs> I also know loads of people are doing really, really well with no, it. No, no, I didn't say they're and not working. And it's not I'm a problem. saying it's, it's a process. No, There's no. a big hype. Still, it's growing. There it's a, this definitely needs to be done. But uh, yeah, we, we see some challenges there as well, obviously. Yeah. Like everything. Uh, experiment, experimentation and it, it is a must. Uh, and specifically yeah, for, test, test for, for motivation, obviously, you know, uh, shop abandonment are probably at all time high, or and it's very very difficult to convert, right? Um, how how do you uh, do that? I mean, what are the tactics or the things that you find that are very helpful? And I know it's brand dependent, it, it definitely niche dependent, and definitely brand dependent. Even two brands competing with the same uh, in the same product with the same buyers, it, it's you can't you know generalize everything but what are the things that you see right in this category yeah i mean the the exact execution is going to be brand Mm -hmm. brand specific but essentially it's um are your are your customers wowed by your product right as i mentioned earlier so have they got a pain point that they're trying to get away from or have they got a desired outcome they're trying to achieve in some cases it'll be both um in some cases you can pitch it either way Mm -hmm. depending on you know, you, you could just test different methods, but essentially, yeah, it's um, you know, do I do I want to lose weight or do I want to be healthier, right? You know, the the healthier thing is a more the desired outcome, but the losing weight is the the pain point, right? I'm you know I'm overweight, I want to lose it. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, it kind of depends on how you want to pitch it, but that's essentially it, right? If I'm reading this about this product, if I'm looking at the product page, looking through the um the the benefits that you're listing. And the the information in your in your videos in your imagery, do I genuinely believe that this product is going to get me there? Um, and that well, that your product is going to get me there as well. Mm-hmm. So a point I was making to this nutrition brand actually was, um, they've got people who 
they've got people who are buyers of their category. And so all they've got to do is convince them that they are the product mm -hmm. for, for this person to buy. There's also people who aren't necessarily convinced by the category in the first place and are new to the idea mm -hmm. of you know, nutritional supplements and things for children. So there, I mean, you, you still have essentially doing the same thing, but you've got to persuade people that you know, this product itself is actually worth buying because it's, you know, really, really, it's going to be really, really beneficial to their children. Yes. Um, so it, yeah, it comes down to, yeah, most of it comes down to pain points, desired outcomes. Do I, do I genuinely believe this product's going to do it? And some of that is UGC, social proof. Some of it is the messaging you use. Um, you know, when you talk about mixes of ingredients and the method you've used to to create it, you know, various things depending on what what your business um, does and sell. But when it comes to abandoned carts, as you mentioned, the the biggest issues we see are, you know, still obviously additional fees. Right, they're still a killer. They always will be. Um, you know, I know there's there's a bit of a debate on should you offer free shipping or should you try and make it clear that uh, that, that you know they should they should pay for shipping um, and that the cost of the product is cheaper, whatever. I don't know. Free shipping works, right? It 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 is a pain point. It is a blocker. Yeah. Um, but the other the other issues are either someone got distracted and so they just left, um, or I mean they're the tab could still be open on their on their screen. They've just, you know, suddenly someone's called them or whatever. They've got distracted or if they're browsing on their phone, they've arrived at their destination. You know, now I, I need to put that away and see my friends or whatever. And and then the third part is they weren't wowed, right? Yeah. They, they read through the features. They found the product. They selected their options. They read through the features and went, yeah, okay, um, I'll get this. Add it to cart. In that cart, they see that you know they're about to spend eighty dollars on this product, and they go, "Do I, do I actually need this? Do I want this right now?" Yeah. Like maybe, maybe I'll think about it. Maybe I'll get it next week instead. Right. That's where we lose people. Yeah. That's where we we want people getting to that stage. Where ideally, like even just adding to cart because they're thinking, "I, I want this. Right? I want this right now because this is going to be beneficial to me," and then. They don't even think about that cart step, right? They 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 add to cart, mini cart pops open. They just go, yeah, cool. Let's let's move forwards and so so you do that. Out and you did that through messaging, through variety of media assets, or some specific behavior. It's yeah, it, it is normally messaging. Yeah. I mean, it all comes down to messaging, really. Yeah. Um, but whether that's some of the text that you use in the description and how you talk about the products, it could be the images that you use. Or sometimes the information you place on images. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's something we talk about a lot. You know, using kind of annotated images, really, where instead of just showing the product, we show the product and we also state here are some of the benefits of it. Yes, yes, and things like that. So it's yeah, it's just getting people to realise that you know this this product is going to be the the game changer for them. Um, and if we can get them to that state, you know, your, your chance of purchase um, quite significantly increases. Great, real interesting stuff. Um, what are some of the tips you can provide for other digital commerce leaders out there, probably on the agency side? Um, I think two things would be like just keep speaking to customers, mm -hmm. um, whether that's your clients uh, themselves to to help you make your business better, or speaking to your your clients' customers to find out you know what you can do better for them. Um, and the other thing. Is is like don't be afraid to ask for help. Hmm. Well, I think you know even as like agency owners, right? I know we, we kind of are, but we are the experts, obviously. But I think there's this feeling that you're supposed to be an expert in everything. In everything, yes. Right, and and it's there's a hesitation to ask for help because you will look weak, you will look bad. But actually, I mean, if it's if it's not related to what you do. Or it's uh, you know, something that hasn't popped up before, and you're just like, oh, you know, someone else might know an app for this. You know, there's absolutely no harm in asking. Yes, um, because you you can't be you can't be everywhere at once, seeing everything that pops up. Um, you're not going to know everything. 
if you're not going to retain that information, right? So even if you have come across it, um, you might forget. I've I've learned so much from just networking with people and just you know asking, um, asking for help, right. especially agencies that were that were bigger than us um, previously. You know, speaking to their founders and and saying like, what what do you recommend I do at this stage yeah. to help us get further? And people are happy people are happy to talk, right? I don't think I've hmm, not quite true. I've had one person who just immediately said, you know, book via this link, and it was a it was a payment link, um, which is I, I suppose fair enough, right? I'm asking for his time, um, but I think that's the only person, only one person ever has asked me to pay for that. Everyone else is just, yeah, fine, let's jump on a call, yeah, fifteen minutes, whatever. Nice. So, yeah, keep doing research and keep asking for help. Yeah, I like it. You know the way you define yourself and. Uh, and your agency because and even if you've uh, been visiting the website it's very very focused right that's the place to talk CRO right and you also I think the main message in there is you on a video saying hey give us a chance right we work for a few months and we show you we can improve dramatically your business results uh, in other words yep. don't pay us if we if we are unable to do that so that's that's a very very strong and compelling statement right <laughs> so yeah. well, well done on that uh, well, uh, that's the time of the episode where I usually ask my guest about a fun fact about themselves that most of their professional network are not aware of. Um, I don't know how fun the fact is, <laughs> uh, but I, I have um, I have two metal plates in my cheek because uh, I, I broke my cheek playing rugby. Wow! When really? I was seventeen, yeah, that put an end put an end to my rugby. It put an end. Um, it career. stopped. Wow. Yeah, I had, I had to stop after that. If I, uh, it's it's not recommended that I break that cheek again. Oh yeah, um, that that would be problematic for me. <laughs> okay, um, I understand. Wow. But yeah, it's um, you remember people are always a bit sh- yeah. always a bit shocked by that. Yeah, sure. You remember? Do I remember it? You remember everything, and uh, you're. In I, I do yeah. actually. Yeah. I was I was not knocked out. Okay. Uh, I remember lying on the ground, being walked off the pitch going to the medical center at school then that's when things get a bit hazy <laughs> so the actual i can remember the incident really well okay um but yeah and i actually found out years later that um i think it was the the surgery i i thought my surgery happened a week later it was actually two weeks later <laughs> okay so i've i've lost that week yeah, and right. also basically that that entire term of school was just a write-off because i just, I just can't remember it okay <laughs> wow wow but everything is an experience in life right and probably yeah you know, how this incident helped me you know go into cro and work with brands and so that's uh it it taught me a valuable lesson in rugby okay which is not so useful to me now because i don't play but that lesson is um don't don't run out of position and make a tackle that is not your responsibility <laughs> when there is someone there making that tackle at the same time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, nice. That's how you end up with a broken cheek. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, how people can find you? Uh, either customerswhoclick.com. Um, we've actually got a nice new website that we launched uh, yeah. quite recently. Very nice. Um, so there's loads of information on there mm-hmm. or LinkedIn. Uh, so Great. just Will Lawrence and on LinkedIn. I, I share CRO content on there uh, every day. Great. And we will share all the information on the show on the episode show notes. So really thank you for, for your time, Will. It was really a pleasure having you here. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much for having me. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Your support means the world to us. If today's episode has been insightful for you, consider sharing it with someone who would also benefit. Even one share can make a big difference. Looking to elevate your e-commerce game? Discover Vimy, a multi-channel e-commerce platform that will transform your business with the power of shoppable video. Visit us at vimy.net to learn more. It's vimy, V-I-M-M-I dot net. Thank you for being part of our journey. Stay tuned for more invaluable insights in our next episode.